bunch of other stuff that I have written down as well. So um, I think that's it. Let me get the formal YouTube intro out of the way and then we will let it rip. <clears throat> Hey everyone, Anthony Fantano here, internet's busiest music nerd. Hope you're doing well. And today we are doing an exclusive interview and conversation uh, with the one and only multi-instrumentalist, producer, songwriter, YouTube and social media personality, Mr. Rick Beato. Uh, came through with his uh, busy schedule, made some time for me, and I appreciate you making the uh, making the time. How are you doing, man? Doing great, Anthony. Appreciate you uh, asking me. I'm, I'm glad to be here and a huge fan of you, of yours. All right. Um, you know, for anybody in chat who is not initiated, which I imagine most people here are, but still, you know, just just give people a little bit of background on who you are and like, you know, where they can find you and what they'll find when they do. So I am a I've been on YouTube for about six years. Mm -hmm. I'm a former music producer. And uh, before that, I was uh, played in bands, but I was music pr producer for about 25 years or so. I started on YouTube in 2016. Um, I just hit 3 million subscribers. Uh, Congratulations on that. Thank you. Uh, and I post on Instagram and on TikTok. I've got, I don't know, on Instagram, 500 and something thousand. And and then uh, I just started posting on TikTok probably six months ago or so. And this is just for fun. I do. I play guitar on those things. That's That's my one of my instruments that I play, but that's the one that I enjoy the most. So I use those as my outlet to just to get on and play every day. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I teach all different types of things. I mean, my, my channel started out as a music theory, improvisation, uh, mainly based around jazz and classical music, modern, modern composition techniques. And then it morphed into music production. I have a series called what makes the song great. Mm -hmm. I do top 20 countdowns. I talk about current music. I have interviewed a lot of well-known um, people, and so that's that's kind of what I do. Okay, you know, so you're listing, you're critiquing, you're interviewing. That, that, that's what we do a lot over here. So you know, if you guys uh, are into what I'm doing, you should most definitely be into what Rick is doing. Um, you know, but for the most part, like you know, you come with it with a different focus, with obviously a different level of experience than than I do, um, and a different kind of taste as well, uh, which um, when I announced the interview, I feel like a lot of people who were responding to the announcement thought that that was going to be like a point of contention between us. Like, oh, Rick, he's a boomer. You guys are just going to argue about like, you know, <laughs> uh, what whether or not new music is good. And um, I mean, while you have your criticisms, as do I, I've, I've never gotten the sense that you just sort of like blindly hate new music across the board. I um, don't hate I don't hate new music. I've worked in contemporary music until 2016. I right. made my living working with, you know, ha I've had hit records in the last 10 years. Right. Well, I, contemporary I, I, records. I guess what know. I want to say is like, you know, <laughs> like if if I feel like you kind of already did, but if you want to further like demystify that assumption and, and where do you feel like that assumption comes from? I think the assumption comes from that that. A lot of the videos that get big on my channel, I have over a thousand videos. Right. And right. and you know, some people be like, Oh, I've heard of your channel. I saw your top 20 drum intros mm -hmm. video or whatever. Mm -hmm. And and they've seen one of my videos. Right. And um I think that I do a lot of I'll do top 10 Spotify countdowns where I will talk about the music and I always find the positive things to say about about the uh, you know, people will um, uh, you know, I might do top 20 pop countdowns, uh, then I'll do metal, then I'll do rock, then I'll do, you know, um, and, and I talk about contemporary music a lot on my channel. I don't know where the whole thing though, where the boomer thing is, maybe because I play guitar, uh, <laughs> And you're, that's you're, it. You're a silver fox who plays guitar. So people are just going to make that assumption. Right. I, I mean, mean, that's, you know, I mean, like, look, I'll, I'll say like, especially in terms of like the Spotify videos, sometimes the titles are contentious. But if you actually do watch the video, like, I mean, you were even complimenting the various guitar parts on Lil Nas X's Montero and playing through that yourself, right. like in the video. It's like, I don't know if you get more like complimentary toward modern pop music than that you're hearing one of the most popular artists play one of his most popular songs you're like hey this guitar part's pretty fucking sick let me just like play it in front of you 
Well, people on my channel complain that I say anything good about contemporary music, but mm. I'm big into music production. Right. So there's so much good music production that's in, especially in pop music, uh, that even if I don't like the song, I cannot like any of the elements, yet I like to listen to it as a producer mm. because it has great low end. It's got great, you know, it it's mixed well it's got great sounds the vocals are really interesting so I'll, I'll listen to music for different reasons there's records that i don't like the music but are recorded so well that i listen to them for sonic enjoyment if that makes sense no it does and what you say there kind of illustrates another kind of interesting dynamic there with you know what you might highlight as like your core audience some of whom may um identify more personally with the eras of music that you may cover and like, you know, some of those top 20 drum intro countdowns or something like that, or, or guys who just like see you and are like, Hey, I, I'd have a beer with that guy. I'm like that guy. I see myself in that guy. Um, you know, but you're also seeing comments from them. Like, why is he liking this new stuff? This isn't like this. This isn't like, this isn't what, this isn't what like we grew up with. Like, what, what do you feel like you're hearing an understanding about contemporary music that maybe some of your older viewers aren't that you wish that they could kind of like get and appreciate? Well, I made this funny video about the um, um, what was it about it was it was a it was a joking video about Charlie Puth mm. about this the thing that was wrong with his song with, with his new song was yeah. that it was that it was actually done tastefully <laughs> <laughs> that it actually had a good melody to it uh -huh. and and this is why his song wasn't working he put it out on TikTok and it had all these views before it was done. And then it was a really good melody, which is why it, why it's it's it was flopping. Uh -huh. And and but people didn't even get the people were confused that I was being sarcastic about it, but I was being serious about it. Mm. Uh, the new Kendrick Lamar record I've been listening to, and it's there's some amazing stuff on it. But people my age uh, tend to not get into hip hop, although Kendrick Lamar is, is kind of a different. The, much more sophisticated musically, lyrically, rhythmically. So that that's that's kind of in its own category. But you know, if I said something nice about Juice World, you know, that has right. actually really good melodies, which you have, which I have, and uh, you know, that kind of emo rap sound, mm -hmm. I really like because it's 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 uh, it musically has has its own thing and it has a mood to it. And, but people my age t tend to not like things like that. And I understand it. But honestly, Anthony, my biggest demographic on my channel, only by a little bit, is 25 to 34, right? ironically. Mm -hmm. But maybe that's just because there's more people that age that are on YouTube. So that's going to be a bigger part. Yeah, possibly. I mean, you know, I'm mostly like 16 to 35 as far as the people who watch me. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there, there's that. Uh, you know, though, though 35 is more kind of like thinning out on that end. Um, you know, I'll say personally, like there may be only a few people in my life personally who are around my age who I can still kind of like talk new music with. You know what I yeah. mean? Whereas like most of the people who I maybe knew from high school are getting to the point where they're like, yeah, you know, I still watch your channel every once in a while, but I don't know who the hell any of these people are. And, you know, these may have been people who maybe watched me religiously, like when I was starting 10 years ago, and were like, yeah, these sure. are all my favorite bands. Like, you know, oh, you're reviewing Arcade Fire. I love Arcade Fire. Um, you know, but all these newer groups that you're reviewing are newer artists or newer rappers or newer singers. Like, I don't have an idea. I don't have a clue. I don't know where the hell anybody's finding out about any of these people. So... You know, maybe maybe as somebody who's a little further down the road, like explain to me what you feel like is kind of like the cause for this disconnect where as you kind of age and, and we can also maybe even double back a little bit and talk about your Gen Z video after, after this, you know, where you're talking about how Gen Zers aren't as into music. But but simultaneously, I do sort of see like a trailing off of contemporary music interests, like generationally, where once you kind of hit your 30s, you're like whatever music you're holding on to is like most likely whatever you just kind of listen to in your youth. And like, that's it. And you're not really finding out about anything new at that point, you know, it's, but, but obviously I'm not going down that path currently. You did not go down that path. Obviously I did not No. Um, and there are people who I know who don't do anything having to do with music professionally, but they're still very passionate about finding out about new stuff. Like in your experience, what kind of separates the men from the boys in that instance? Like who kind of gives it up and kind of just puts their head in the sand and who kind of sticks with it? 
Well, I think that most people's taste ends around college. If you go to college or, or in your early 20s, I think that's that's where your taste gets solidified. Mm. The, the things that you like and then you don't make room for new things. Mm. In my case, in my 20s, I was a college music professor and I was listening to I was teaching jazz studies and I was listening and I taught jazz history and I listened to. I was listening to all the contemporary jazz music that was coming out because I had to, because it was part of what I was doing. And I listened to a lot of modern classical music because there's a lot of crossover there, what was going on at the time. So I always had to stay current with that. Then in my thirties, I worked as a songwriter and a producer. I got signed to a major publishing deal. I played in bands, but, I, and then I made my, my living as a rock producer hmm. and, but all the, groups that I was working with were playing contemporary music. I started in, I did a lot of new metal records. Okay. I did a lot of uh, records that were singer songwriter records. I mean, th I worked from the mid to late nineties all the way until 2016 when I started my channel, mm -hmm. I had a number one country song as a writer, not one that I produced, but as, as a writer, uh, I had platinum records with bands like uh, this band Need to Breathe. I had or I had three gold records with them. I had a platinum record with this band Shine Down early in oh, their first record. I remember Shine Down. Yeah, two thousand two, something like that. It was a long time, you know, twenty years ago now. Mm -hmm. But uh, I worked with contemporary bands, so I always listened to whatever was going on at the time. Up until I started my YouTube channel. So, and you know. Most people that work on contemporary music, if it's pop music, most of the mixers are guys that are, they're mostly guys and they're mostly in their fifties or sixties even. Mm. And uh Serb and Ghania that's mixes every big pop hit on the radio has for the last 20 years. He's got to be almost my age. I'm 60 years old, you know, and, and historically people in their, you know, forties, fifties and sixties, have actually written, whether it's Max Martin or whoever, the people that are writing a lot of these songs, not in rap and hip hop, but the but pop music, they're all people that are older. Right. So this this uh if you work in the business, you have to stay current with it. And mm -hmm. and that's how your tastes keep evolving and, and you uh you know when you're actually having to work on things. Yeah, you know, I mean, I, you know, I kind of feel like music taste, at least kind of keeping up with it. In my experience, it's it's kind of like any other uh, understanding contemporary music or appreciating is kind of like just a, 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 any other skill. And if you don't use it, you lose it. And right. whatever's going on with new music, it's kind of just like this ongoing evolutionary beast that's kind of just existing in front of you. And if you kind of turn away and you don't pay attention to it for like five years, you're going to turn around and be like, whoa, this looks completely different than what I remember it being like. I don't even know where to approach this. I don't understand this. I'm just going to pay attention to something else because trying to figure it out would be too much labor on my part. I'd rather go live in, I guess, kind of like a, you know, a nostalgic memory. Well, I, it's funny that you say, say that I was a, I taught college for five years from, from 87 to 92. And there was about three years where I didn't do anything but listen to jazz because I was really involved in you know, my new job and really from grad school, you know, 85 to, to nine, really 85 to 90 is, is when I was in this jazz coma, as I called it. Mm -hmm. And I didn't listen to any contemporary, any contemporary music other than that, that was going on. And then I had a student that brought in the Nirvana bleach album mm -hmm. and said, Oh, this, you got to check this out. And I heard, it, I said, is this what people are listening to? I mean, I was 20, eight at the time he's like well this is really more indie rock this is what they play on they're playing on the college radio stations before nirvana blew up and and all the seattle bands that were you know on sub pop and and uh some of them had gotten signed Soundgarden. uh it's really in the late very late 80s but it was just kind of pre-grunge era and it's, it's interesting. I'm doing an interview. I'm interviewing Chris Novoselic and Kim Thale and Jack and Dino in a couple of weeks when in Seattle. Uh, and Jack and Dino produced a lot of those early. He produced, you know, Mud Honey, Soundgarden, uh, early records, Green River, L7, 
um, like all those those uh, early grunge bands. And so I've gone back and I have to study all that. Now that wasn't music. I had to catch up on five years of music then when I started working then in rock music in the early nineties, mm-hmm. when, when all that hit. So that was, that was kind of a time. It's just like you're talking about five years go by. It's like, Whoa, what is, what have I missed? I missed a lot. I gonna and I have to catch up on it. So yeah. Going from the dying breaths of hair metal and, you know, like hard rock to just the beginnings of grunge is, you know, can, can, can be a difficult transition, I'm sure. Right. Um, so, so, uh, so I wanted to kind of go back to that Gen Z being interested in music video that, uh, that, that you had done recently. This obviously is something that concerns you. Uh, and, and I wanted to know because you kind of left it off at the end of the video in the way that you did, um, you know, is, is there something in your mind in terms of like, I don't know, a potential dystopian future that you're seeing as a result of these paradigm shifts or, you know, uh, when you were kind of asking for the audience to throw comments out there, did they give you any kind of insight or ideas to, you know, what might be so concerning about this? Well, it's, it's kind of, it's in some ways that it's self-selecting people that watch my channel are, are music people. So right. young people that watch it say, I don't agree. I, I got into, you know, I was talking about video games that, that, that kids play, my kids play, all my kids, friends play, and they're really into that. That's kind of the thing that kids do. And you know, my kids play sports and things too, but, but video games are just ubiquitous and people just didn't spend this kind of time on screens. It just, you know, it's never been, We've never lived in a time where people are on their phones nonstop mm-hmm. and uh, and consuming, especially now, short form uh, content just without the ability to kind of sit and focus on music. And I, th- I just find a general uh, from talking to people that have kids that are Gen Zers, a lot, plenty of my friends, they find that their kids are just not interested in music like we were back when we were growing up. And I, and there's not, you know, you can't generalize completely about these things, but you know, people, you can generalize about the fact that people spend a lot of time you know, <laughs> looking at TikTok and, and Instagram and YouTube. And I spend time watching your TikToks and your Instagrams and YouTube. So uh-huh. I, mean, I do. I I think yours are hilarious. And I'll sit there and I'll just watch one after the other. And and are people getting into music and listening to it like that? Or are they, you know, kids playing video games and and yeah, music is cool. It's it's cool. Well, what's your favorite band? Uh what's your favorite group? What's your favorite song? Hmm. And then you just never get any answers. It's really I think it's, it's, uh, I've never seen anything like it. Is it concerning to me? Um, you know, I don't know what, I don't know how people's behaviors are going to change. Uh, these, the social media companies are really now pushing short form content even more. That's kind of, you know, that's what people do. And that's what people enjoy, you know, sitting down, listening to a record with headphones reading the album covers or whatever, or just listening in your room is just something I, you know, I don't know, maybe I do that still, Hmm. but I don't see a lot of kids doing that. Yeah. I mean, at least among people in my audience, you know, the music nerd types who, you know, are really into the album reviews. I mean, it's, it's happening, but I, I guess like, I, I think the way, that the internet has allowed people to consume music because thinking of not just how it was when you were younger, but when I was younger too, you know, there was like a certain kind of level of commitment that was required for entry, you know, yeah. into the world of an artist, you know, you had to throw some money down and you had to yeah. run down to the store and so on and so forth. Whereas like, I, I think the way that you can consume things these days allows for this extreme level of casualness. You know, and 
it doesn't need to suck you in like it used to in order to, you know, kind of uh, get some exposure to music, which I think, you know, everybody needs to have a happy and healthy life. Um, it comes like way easier with way less effort than it used to uh, to get that exposure. But simultaneously, like the people who are really into it are still like really, are really into, into it. it. And, yeah. and the fact that, you know, it does come with so much ease allows them to dive even harder into it than even I could as a kid who felt like, I mean, I personally, I felt like I was very passionate about music as, as a kid with what exposure I was able to get to it through money that I could save for cassettes, MTV, the radio later down the road, like TRL or all my metalhead friends in high school. Um, you know, and eventually like illegally downloading stuff on Napster, <laughs> which I kind of graduated to. Um, yeah, but but you know, the 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 people who are really into it get so into it, and the internet allows them to almost like uh, uh, abuse the ease at which you can get access to everything. So it's like you know, it's it's like there's what what you're observing or what you've observed. I think is almost like a disappearance of a middle ground, where it's like everybody's kind of like on this higher level of like maybe wider appreciation where most people have like, you know, hard copies of the most best-selling records and, you know, they kind of become these like universal experiences that everybody can kind of touch down on. And there are some artists like that these days that you could mention that are like that. Drake is maybe an example. Yeah. You know, whatever Drake puts out, you know, everybody's going to hear it. Yeah. You know, but, but simultaneously, like, that's an album that people are going to be listening to for a few months and it's going to get rotated out for something else. You know, so it's 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 like, again, it's like a disappearance of the middle ground. And you have these people who are extremely like couldn't tell you who their favorite song is or artist is. They just kind of like a certain playlist or vibe or something. And then you have these people that like know people who are 16 and they're on TikTok recommending noise or obscure noise rock bands. I didn't know about until I was 28. You know, it's like, how the hell do you right. know about all these bands? Like, I didn't know about any of them until I was almost 30. Um so, you know, th 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 that's my observation anyway. I I know if I go to the Tame Impala play, uh, radio that I'm going to hear a consistent thing that I like. Right. So. So. Right. Yet I don't have to look at the who the artists are. I can just listen to it and it goes from artist to artist and I can enjoy it and never know who any of the groups are. Right. And I don't even have to look at my phone. I can just put it on or or, you know, play it through my browser. Mm. And and I know that it's going to be of a consistent vibe that I will enjoy. Um, you know. So that part of it, the owning of things was a really big, important part of growing up. You had to save money to go spend 15 bucks for an LP or $18 for a CD. I mean, CDs were 18 bucks, 19 bucks for a new CD. At, you know, some new releases were, which is insane to think. And you were buying it based on one song that you heard, either saw on MTV or heard on the radio. And you took your chances. And then because you spent that money, <laughs> you listened to every song because you couldn't give it back. So right. you really got into these bands, you know, that's, that's, that's the thing. Whereas now it's like, yeah, I don't like that track. Pfft, move on to the next one. Nah, that one's not very good. Move on to the next one. Nah, oh, that's pretty good. I'll listen to that one. And then you have your three favorite songs that you have on there. Then you put a like next to them and you put them in a playlist and you kind of discard the rest of it. And that's it. There is no album experience, you know, <laughs> there is no, uh, <coughs> you know, um, I, I've I've been on been listening to Kate Bush. I'm I'm have a Kate Bush video coming out tomorrow. And I went back and I listened Six. to her her aerial record that came out in 2005. And that was a record that she had done 2005 or 2006. She hadn't done a record in 18 years then. And um right. and and she's just a brilliant, brilliant artist who is you know, you, her career goes back to 1978. Her first record came on. She has a number one song right now, and and because uh, of Stranger Things, and is one of the most influential artists. She never really toured. She made her own records that she produced. So these are things with my job, just like with your job, is listening to music all the time. When I make a video on somebody, I go back 
and study their history. And these are records that I haven't listened to in, um, in years. And I hear, um, uh, you know, I'll be like, Oh my God, I can't believe that. It's been so long stuff that I, you know, her first record came out when I was in 10th grade, 1978, hmm. same year as the first police record Van Halen one came out in 78. I mean, it was a 1978 was a great year. Uh, but, uh, you know, but getting back to, to kids and, and, and then you just kind of follow the careers of these people. But today it seems that people are, um, not everybody, people that watch your channel, people that watch my channel are not like that hmm. necessarily. I just see it in kind of the average kids that I meet. Hmm. So, um, is there, is there an alarm to be sounded? I don't know. Hmm. Not sure. That's kind of why I made the video. Yeah. Just to see what people thought. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, um, you know, pro probably there is something about like, you know, younger kids kind of missing out on something or being kind of like, you know, uh, herded into other forms of entertainment. But, you know, I, I think there's like uh, maybe sort of an emotional depth or something that once they hit maybe their teens or their college years that they're kind of looking for that, like, you know, video games are great, but they can't necessarily provide, you know, the kind of like emotional validation for like an intimate or a personal experience that like a song could speak to, you know what I mean? And I, I think that's why, you know, we're, we're sort of like collectively, even though we kind of focus on different things and have different kinds of content, you know, kind of that collectivization within that certain age group of people who are really passionate about their taste when they're in college. And that's when it's kind of solidified. And that's what they're going to be riding out for the rest of their lives, most likely. Right. And I watched a video that that Vox did about three weeks ago, three, four weeks ago about the TikTok to Spotify um, connection. Mm -hmm. And they 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 went through, they found all these viral artists that had not, that were not famous, that were came from being unknown. They had this one kid, Jake, who's got almost 10 million followers on Spotify, and he had a viral video that he did did with his mom. And I was showing my wife and kids this video there. And my kids are like, oh, I, oh, we know that. We've seen that before. They're showing this TikTok video, right? Mm. And it had 9 billion streams or whatever. And then the kid, it, it talked about how at first these TikTok artists would get record deals and the re record label would be in like a 90-10 deal. Then it was 80-20. Then it was 50-50. Then it was 90-10 towards the TikTokers. And then the TikTokers were set, thought, well, why do we need a record label? We're already famous. And right. so they're not, they don't even do any record deals. And people that I know that work at record labels, all they do is look at TikTok. That's it. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing that they use to gauge who to sign. Mm -hmm. And there's no a and r -ing. There's nobody saying Gary Gersh, he signed Nirvana. You know, he heard Bleach. Bleach sold 46,000 records. Thurston Moore told him you should sign Nirvana. He went and heard him, said, I'm going to sign him. And they made Nevermind, you know? So that's a and r -ing, taking a chance on something that you don't know whether it's going to be successful, as opposed to signing things that are already have hundreds of millions of views. Right. You know? Yeah, it's it seems so, like a lot of the PR work is not so much making something popular, but just finding something that's already becoming organically popular uh, without yeah. you and then just trying to pounce on top of that. Like considering that's become the dynamic with all of the music industry experience that you have, like are record labels even serving a purpose at this point? Like, you know, no, no. yeah. <laughs> They're not. And so I, when people ask me about record labels, I said, why are you even talking about record labels? There's nothing. Record labels used to be that to get distribution, you needed a record label. To right. get on Spotify, you had to be on a major label. You don't have to be on a major label anymore to get on Spotify. No. You don't need a record label for anything. That's a, it's, it's ridiculous. I mean, look at our channels, right? Did, we didn't need record labels to, you know, we, didn't, we don't need media. Media is, you just, we create uh, content through YouTube or through the different social media platforms. And the marketplace decides whether they think that your content is worth looking at.
Mm -hmm. And that's the way the music business is now. No, I, I agree. And to sort of echo that, I mean, if you're somebody who's on TikTok and you are or you find yourself in a position where you're all of a sudden like getting platinum songs just by posting your tracks on TikTok and a label comes in and offers you something, I mean, all that label is going to do is essentially like just take a cut of your Spotify streaming. That's all that's going to happen. You know, they're, they're not going to do anything else. They'll offer you some money up front, but you have to assume that whatever money they offer you they're going to be expecting to make two, three, four times more money off of whatever they hand you off the bat. So, you know, they're not throwing money at you just to be nice. Like they're doing it in plans to make a profit off of you and what you do. Yeah. And then, the, and once they, you sign to them, then they start telling you what to do. And that's the, uh, that's the downside. After you figured out how to do it right without them, then they're the experts on everything. No, I don't think that song is going to work. Got it. Got it. So, um, I, I wanted to ask you this question that I've asked somebody before, just like from your perspective as a producer, it's, it's kind of a fun hypothetical. And I want to know if you'd have like kind of a different answer or perspective on it. So, you know, let's say like your career from this point out depended on you coming out with a hit song and, yep. uh, you know, which you've done before, obviously. So, you know, this should be familiar territory for you. <laughs> and, you know, one of these has to go. Like the production has to be stellar, the song quality has to be stellar, or, you know, the artist has to be like, you know, stellar, really talented, like really impressive artist, you know, in, in, in your regard. And you have to go without one of those things. And keep in mind, the song <laughs> has to be a hit. So which of those things do yeah. you feel like you could subtract from those three and still manage to come out with a track that kind of climbs pretty high on the charts? Okay, so the song, we have the song, we have the artist, and, and the, production. the production. So one of those can be trash, essentially. So either the artist well, the is trash. production can be trash. Yeah, oh, okay. you can have you can have you can have really crappy production and still have a big hit song. There's plenty of that. Got uh, it. The song has to be great, and the artist has to be able to deliver because right. ultimately, that's um, a great song with the wrong artist won't won't you know won't happen. Mm -hmm. A great artist with a bad song won't happen, or you know if they they have great stage presence, whatever they're great singers. Um, so you have to have the song and you have to have the artist, hmm. a celebrity and a laptop. Got it. So, you know, though, in your estimation, though, it's like with there not being to be so much of a focus on production quality in order to manage, you know, a great song or a hit song. Wh why does it end up taking up so much time, so much effort, so much focus? Why are, you know, uh, uh, uh why are corners not being cut as hard as they possibly could? You know, like, um, I'm trying to remember the, uh. The, the last person who I asked this question, uh, Blake, Blake Slatkin, who I talked to, um, you know, he had the same answer that you did. But simultaneously, he described um, at one point in his career working on that Kid Leroy song. Um, I mean, I'll be right here. Nah, nah. Like, what is what is the song? Do you, do you know that? Do you remember the title of the song? I, has that I, I know the line. song from you singing it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, we, we both know what track I'm talking about. He was talking about being in the sessions, working on the production for that track for a year. You yeah. know? So it's like, you know, even though in the hypothetical, we could say like, oh, the production needs doesn't need to be that good. It's like, yeah, but simultaneously, one of the biggest hit songs that we've had of the past 10 years, we're working on it for a whole year, <laughs> you know? So, I mean, it's like, uh, uh, while maybe what you're saying is true, we're, we're not, we're not ignoring the significance of the production though, in practice. No, the production is one of my, <laughs> I mean, I'm a producer, so right, I like, right. I like the production values to be as good as possible. For sure. You know, that's, uh. You want your things to sound as good as they can sound on every format, whether you're listening on, on an iPhone or you're listening on a nice system with a subwoofer. Mm -hmm. It should sound equally good. So the production is incredibly important, which is why labels hire pro mixers. And mm -hmm. But, you know, a lot of kids today can make incredibly good sounding mixes on their own, and they just test them out in their car, on their stereos, wherever, until they sound good. And they keep what I call micro mixing them. Hmm. And they can come out with as good a mix as somebody that spends one day on it, a pro mixer that spends one day on it. Hmm. Um, one of the things that I noticed, though, Anthony, that, that a genre of music that suffers from bad production, I think, is a lot of contemporary metal. Mm -hmm. uh, historically. You're speaking my love language um, right now. Go on. Yeah. The, historically, metal. Uh, would be all the top bands had the top producers, top engineers and mixers. And 
they knew how to get great sounds. They knew how to give records a signature sound. And they spent a lot of time with these things. Now it's people using plugins, uh, plug-in amplifiers. Um, all the drums have samples on them all the time. And which I understand for, for, um, uh, for certain, for certain styles. I just did it in interview, um, with Ken Andrews, who's, who's a singer from the band filter or, or not, not failure. Uh, sorry, Ken. Um, and, uh, I was a really big, big fan of the band. They had the, the, that record fantastic planet that came out in 1996 had a sound yeah. called stuck on you. That's a big hit. And he's doing a documentary that I was, he interviewed me for uh, last week. They were in, he was in town playing with the band and um, he produced the record and it sounds amazing. It's one of the best heavy rock records of the nineties. And I mean, it's just really outstandingly good sounding. So good that not only did I love the sound of the record, I went to see them live just to see how they got some of the sounds. Mm. And I feel that a lot of, when I do the top Spotify countdown to the metal playlist, it's most of the guitar sounds are so badly recorded. The records are badly mixed, really just unprofessional. Mm. And there were guys like Andy Wallace, that were incredible mixers um, that could mixed a lot of the heavy records back in the nineties and, and, uh, and two thousands. And, um, and, you know, most of these bands are mixing records themselves nowadays because they don't budgets or they think they can do a good job and they just don't sound that good. Mm. So, um, so that's the one genre that I think is suffers the most from bad production actually. No, I mean, I, I agree. I mean, I've, you know, spoken about such things in reviews and I've gotten like completely fucking flamed for it, uh, you know, over and over and over. I mean, <clears throat> I, I agree with the points that you've made in terms of like the production being able to suck, you know, in, in sort of like that hypothetical. But I mean, I, I think there's like legitimate points with any answer. I mean, you know, take, take hypothetically, if we said artist, like, which I think the proof in the pudding is that like, the proof, the proof in the pudding is kind of manifesting in take how many artists have gotten like major hits, major hits over like the past 10 years who kind of like disappear in like three to four years. You know what I mean? Yeah. And the reason they're so interesting off the bat is because maybe they have a certain particular sound that is very hot for a short period of time and they're not versatile enough to kind of evolve past it. Or they're so heavily dependent on studio trickery in order to make them sound listenable that there's like not really a whole lot of substance or depth there. So the artist can totally be trash. The song, I mean, <clears throat> not that it's necessarily proof of a bad song, but as you've kind of observed in some of these videos that you've done where you are going through like, you know, Spotify top tens, there are a lot of tracks where, you know, it, it so much doesn't really feel like a song as much as it feels like a motif that's ingeniously extended out by okay here's the chords now we're going to play them double time and now we're going to do another section where we just add another instrument over the same beaten chords and you're hearing the same damn chord progression for three minutes throughout the whole song and the chorus doesn't even feel distinct from the verse like you know to me right that's kind of it's it's not the worst way to operate within writing a song sure there are plenty of great artists who have written tracks like that i mean you know, there's plenty of a repetitive danceable linear David Bowie or LCD sound system songs that kind of, you know, work something like that. But, you know, with that being said, um, it, it, it is kind of like a very half-baked way of going about things. And to hear it become such a replicable formula in, you know, the top 10 these days, uh, you know, to me is at least proof that you can basically half-ass your way through a song and still have it kind of be a hit as long as you have a vocal melody or an artist that people are attracted to. And the production is like, glossy and lush and pretty enough that it sounds like, Oh, this is kind of pretty to listen to. Yeah, I agree. The, but the records that, that have withstood the test of time have a sound. If you go back and I think about Beatles revolver or the black sure. album, Metallica for the people that like, or master of puppets for the people that hate the black album. Um, or uh, <laughs> I'm pro black album, by the way, anybody who says I'm pro black album sounds, sounds amazing. And people that, that, 
It does. It sounds it sounds amazing. Master of Puppets is good, but my God, Bob Rock knows how to record, knew how to record guitars. The drums had their own signature sound on that record. Everything was signature, and the vocals were phenomenal. Oh my God, the James Hetfield never sounded better. That record is 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 just so well done. Um, but if I listen to the second Lincoln Park record, the production is so good on that Meteora. Well, the first two Lincoln Park records, Don Gilmore produced them, and and they were massive sounding. They're really great. You know, whether you like Lincoln Park or not, they were, you know, gigantic, low end, the guitar sounds, everything. It just was so well done. The integration of the of the rapping with the with the with the singing is, you know, and drum sounds, everything. So so the the you know, then you talk about Back in Black or Fleetwood Mac Rumors, all the biggest records of all time, Boston's first record. They were just, every song sounded consistent. The records had their own sounds and they've withstood the test of time. Mm -hmm. Most of them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, is, is that a phenomenon that you still feel like is, is happening today? Um, I mean, I, you know, I, I would say... Kendrick to Pimp a Butterfly, I would say, yeah. <clears throat> you know, again, LCD sound system, this is happening. Uh, people would argue My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy Kanye or even Yeezus. I mean, you know, I mean, this, this is still a thing. It's still a thing. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's still a thing. Um, but is it important, though? Mm -hmm. That's is it is it important to the listeners, mm -hmm. um, to, to people that were hi-fi listeners back then um uh i don't I, I don't know it's it's um i don't perceive music the way that i did when i was younger by the fact that you know because of the fact that i'm 60 years old hmm. i was thinking about this earlier okay so my, my nine-year-old I have a tone generator on my phone and I was curious. So I put it at 19.6 K and I turned it on and I was about 20 feet from her. And immediately she goes, what's that? Now to me, it's silent. Hmm. Right. 15 K is a sine wave at 15 K I'm 60 years old is silent. Hmm. There's, there's a whole music of the ether that, that young people can hear all this information. Young people can hear the people that my age, and I've got a great ear. And I can hear things. I know when I hear a core, you know, a song, I can figure it out instantly. Mm. But there's all this content that is being lost that as you age, you don't hear as well. Mm. And uh, so the, it, something I really think about a lot, the production is really, really important, especially the stuff that's in the mid range. <laughs> that you can still hear you know mm -hmm. so um so it changes as you get older the uh the you know kind of your impression of these things mm -hmm. um so I, I wanted to ask you uh <clears throat> kind of going back to a point that was being made earlier about the consumption of music uh, and and things that are kind of concerning you know for me the thing that's concerning is almost like the playlistification of stuff that you were alert, alluding to earlier. You know, I, I don't so much worry personally about like whether or not it, the, 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 the mode or means through which people are getting a hold of music, does it demand a certain level of devotion from them, you know, to get into a record or get into an artist? That, that's, that's not so much a, a, what I worry about as much as I worry about like, is the algorithm or is whatever platform that they're on, without them being aware of it, bricking them up into this very tiny, narrow hallway through which, unless they're really putting effort into it, they will never escape <laughs> because like, you know, it's, it's never going to encourage them oh, to try yeah. anything different. Well, we all live in these curated algorithms from what we look at on YouTube, what we listen to on, on Spotify or Apple music, whatever it is. Sure. Unless you get rid of your, history i mean i'll go and do my spotify recommendations are all so out of whack because i'll do <laughs> I'll go listen to the top 10 pop songs 
I mean, I typically would do this stuff on a Sunday morning. I sit outside in my backyard, I drink coffee, and I go and listen to the top songs on the charts. That's kind of what I do. Hmm. And or I'll pick at records I haven't listened to in a long time. Long time. I was listening to the Flaming Lips. Um, uh, what is it? Uh, soft. Um, uh, why do I don't uh, know. Soft Bulletin. Is yeah. that it? Yeah, Soft Bulletin. Uh, they came out in 1999. Dave Friedman record. Incredibly well done record. And I love Wayne Coyne's weirdo voice. And um, so I'll pick a couple of records like that that I'll listen to just before anybody even gets up. I'm 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 going through, but but the recommendations that I get are are all over the place. But most people are really pigeonholed because of these algorithms mm-hmm. that they only get served up a certain thing. If you liked this, then you're going to like this because it's just about exactly the same thing. I wanted to ask you, given um, a series that's on your YouTube channel where you kind of go over like the various historical plot lines of guitar music generally, um, you know, and and how it sort of evolved as an instrument over, you know, these various eras of music. Like currently, what do you feel like, especially given that there was almost like a touch and go period in the 2010s where in top pop songs, it was almost like little to no guitar, you know, to be found like left and right. But it kind of seems like it's coming back in a lot of contexts now. Yes. Um, Yeah. I I wanted to know in in your mind, because uh, as much as you can describe it, uh, because obviously we're not done with this era yet and we're not going to know what it is until it's over. But like, what do you feel like are some of the defining characteristics and applications of guitar contemporarily or what you're kind of hearing as of late? What makes 2010s and kind of late you know, uh, uh, I, I guess, you know, early 2020s guitar is an era kind of de- different or, you know, defined as opposed to in the 80s or 90s or any previous era. Well, we have some of the best guitar players that have ever lived are alive right now. Hmm. Just ge- brilliant uh, people that have learned to play the guitar and in new invented new ways to play it. And a lot of that is in the progressive metal movement that I've been a really big supporter of and fan of for the last few years on my channel. I've had Tosin Abasi on. uh, Well, I had the whole Animals as Leaders were here in the studio, and I've done many interviews with Tosin. Uh, Tim Henson, Polyphia, uh, uh, Periphery, um, Pliny, all the guitar groups have all come here. I've featured their songs on my channel. And I'm a huge proponent of that genre. To me, that is a, uh, what's going on there is really incredible. I think Mm -hmm. Um, it's forward thinking. People are playing extended range instruments. There's all this new stuff, new ways of playing the guitar techniques. And it's really exciting. So some of the most interesting guitar music has been happening in the last five years. 10 years Mm -hmm. so but not in popular music but it's coming back in popular music and it's more you know a lot of female artists are more than male artists are playing guitar i went to see um i saw her play uh um here in atlanta a few weeks ago i made a video about it and um and it was amazing some of the negative comments about her and she's about her it's so weird her um and she's an excellent musician and um and she's a real rock star and she was out there and it's interesting that she kind of is a a real combination of r&b and rock Hmm. and and um and i just think there's a lot of great female guitar fronted bands out there nowadays and um and so between that and the and the progressive metal i think the guitar is what's going on with the guitar is really exciting Mm -hmm. so and i think when people look back on it they're going to say wow there's there was actually this underground progressive metal thing which is really getting popular now when i go out to to clubs and see these bands come through town they're drawing a couple thousand people Mm -hmm. here into which is amazing. I think it's great. And yeah. these people are really incredible virtuosos just playing inventive things that, that I've never heard before. 
I, I wanted to ask you as well, <clears throat> what kind of keeps you passionate as a music fan, despite, uh, uh, you know, I'll say at least like in my own experience, like people say stuff to me like, oh, you listen to too much music or have you exposed yourself to too much of this or that and you've jaded yourself and that's why you can't fucking like anything. That's why you can't enjoy anything, Anthony. Um, <laughs> I imagine you've heard even more than I have. And on top of it, you know, you have first hand knowledge of, you know, especially when you have the guitar in front of you, you're just like, pff, within 30 seconds, you're just like, bam, here's the chords. I I, I know them. I figured them out. Bam. Um, <laughs> you know, with, with all that knowledge firsthand, like, you know, are, are you at a point where, uh, you know, the, the, the magic of kind of the listening experiences is, is, is lost on you in a way, or, you know, are you, are no. you always kind of like mechanically looking at it, uh, you know, or are you able to kind of turn that off and just kind of enjoy? Oh, I never, ever think about how a song is put together, how it's played, unless I have to show it in a video. Right. It never even occurs to me. There are songs that I've listened to for 45 years that I've done videos on that I never figured out. I did a video on the song um, Josie by Steely Dan. Hmm. I've listened to that thing a million times, heard it on the radio, never once figured it out. Hmm. And I'm, And when I thought about it, okay, what are they actually doing? I could play it, but I never, it never enters my mind how anything is played when I'm listening to it. I just listen to music to enjoy either. I like it and I, I just take it in and I enjoy it. And I like not knowing how it's constructed. Hmm. No, it's, so uh, I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that. Um, you know, it's, it's something that I think about when people are kind of studied and trained and are kind of really into, um, you know, just the craft and the mechanics of music. It, it kind of reminds me of, uh, did, did you see that Kenny G uh, documentary that they came out with recently? I haven't seen, no, no. I haven't seen it. Um, I mean, I highly recommend it. It's great. But uh, th there was kind of an interesting phenomenon in the interview where he was being asked about like, does he listen to music? Does he enjoy music? And and for the most part, his, his answer truly and honestly was kind of like, no, not really. You know, I, I don't really kind of just vibe to, stuff generally whenever i'm hearing music i what i mostly think about is it, it sounds like they practiced a lot to do this you know or i think about how hard they had to work to get this production done or something you know he's, he's kind of an odd bird but very talented guy um and you know i was kind of wondering if there was uh, at least in your own experience kind of like a certain level of virtuosity that you i don't know reach and then you're sort of internalizing or interpreting all music sort of in that way and not able to kind of uh, uh, put yourself back in fan mode no i really never think about unless it's a song that's uh that is the same three chords over and over in <laughs> something, you know, <laughs> then that doesn't have a bridge, doesn't have a chorus, have a bridge, you know, and then just a layer. Uh, yeah. After, then it's, then it's just the monotony of it. I just, I turn it off, but, uh, but I really never ever think about how a song is constructed or how to play unless I sit there with my guitar. It's like, okay, how do you play this? Then I think, okay, what's going on here. Okay. I got it now. Mm -hmm. And then I can just play it. Yeah, speaking, so it's literally turning on and off a switch. Speaking of another kind of like writing on the wall sort of thing, you know, considering the trend that you've spoken on where you are kind of hearing an increase in songs that are assembled in that way. Um, you know, is, is that a concern for you? I, I know you've kind of spoken about the loss of complexity within popular music. Um, you know, is, is that something that you consider seeing or sort of assume will continue to see go downhill and maybe like get to a point where it's, so, so bad everything becomes a monotonous <laughs> repetition of three chords with an added layer after uh, a little bit to sort of make it look like it's a chorus but it's not really well it's funny because when i <laughs> when i make these videos on the top songs you know on spotify or apple music whatever people in the comments right those aren't the most popular songs that's just what spotify tells you they are it's like no i think they are actually the most popular songs right well i don't believe it there's all this stuff out there that's way better than that, that, that people are listening to. It's like, all right, fine. <laughs> so uh, that are, they're much more interesting than those. And, and so um, I don't know, will it change? There's no bridges in any songs anymore. Mm. Songs rarely change keys. I mean, I'm talking popular songs, you know, where there's no bridge over troubled waters or anything that are being written typically these days. Um, uh, 
that's not a hard and fast rule, but for the most part, popular music has gotten simpler. It just has. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, it's simpler. The songs have gotten shorter again. Mm-hmm. You know, but people could say, oh, when the Beatles started out, they did only three chord songs, which is somewhat true. Mm-hmm. But, you know, two years later, they were doing, or three years later, they were they were making Sgt. Peppers. So mm-hmm. um, that changed three. Yeah. So maybe, I mean, maybe it kind of comes and goes in waves. I I feel like also with the Spotify thing, there's almost kind of a lack of appreciation for the fact that like, when you see the most popular songs on Spotify, you also have to understand like those most popular songs on Spotify may be the most popular songs on Spotify because the algorithm has chosen for them to be the most popular songs on Spotify. You know what I mean? Like you can't assume, you know, saying, those aren't the most popular. Well, I mean, yeah, maybe, maybe they're not the most popular songs on another platform or another platform <laughs> on top of that. But you have to consider that like Spotify also has the power to playlist these tracks, recommend right. these tracks. So it's like, you know, you, you can't assume it's all just kind of happening organically or whatever, you know? No, of course. I mean, it's definitely not, not happening organically, but, but the, the fact that, well, those aren't the songs that are on the, on the charts. Like, well, yeah, they are. <laughs> I just looked at them. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, that's also because Spotify is, is the most popular music streaming platform. So it, it, it all kind of tracks. Right. Exactly. Right. So, so, uh, you know, in the past, people bought their way on to, you know, having successful records, even, even records that were popular needed to there, they needed to have payola to get them to where they were hits. That's just a mm-hmm. fact. Yes. Yes. You know, yeah. so it cost. To have a uh, to have a hit song in the past, a hit single, it cost about half a million dollars. Mm-hmm. This is all the way up, up until 2013 or so. This was the case mm-hmm. at, at any radio format. Mm-hmm. You had to spend a half million dollars in, in promotion, radio promotion, to have a hit song, unless it was an established artist. If it was a new artist, that's what you're spending. And then it may be a hit or it may not be a hit, but you had to spend that money. And then the marketplace will decide. Let me ask you this last uh, question, especially since now uh, I, I went to go clean my glasses and I fucked them up. So I'm just going <laughs> to not not spend another half an hour partially blind with you. Um, you know, considering uh, what you were just kind of saying there about like almost the, the olden days of music promotion, which, you know, I, I remember, you know, kind of experiencing personally when I used to intern at radio stations because I used to I started in a radio before I went into YouTube and everything like that. Um <clears throat> And kind of seeing how just almost incestuous the the associations were between like music promoters and labels and radio stations and so on and so forth and programming directors and, and all that. Um, <laughs> you know, obviously that was totally toxic and disgusting. And I'm very happy that most of that world is dead and is uh, dying on the vine and, and suffering and starving to death because it deserves to. Uh, but simultaneously, you know, you've observed and I've observed that, you know, uh, a lot of these labels are essentially just kind of throwing these artists to the dogs at this point. And they're like, yeah, go do your TikTok promotion or we're not going to put out right. your record and so on and so forth. I mean, obviously we've also transitioned to something that's pretty ugly too, but in, in your opinion, is the fact that we're at a point where, you know, an independent artist can go on that platform and just like blow up overnight and then run a really great independent career from there on out. Like the fact that we're at a point where that's possible, you know, does, does that not make it a better trade? Does that not make the current paradigm almost like preferable instead of like, you know, being at a point where, you know, labels are kind of controlling everything and everything's payola and everything's like, you know, sleeping your way up the fucking ladder. Yes. And you and I are a perfect example of that because we are independent. We make our own content and we're successful at doing it on our, on, on YouTube, on, on, uh, on Instagram, on, on multiple platforms. You're hugely successful on, on multiple platforms. And you don't have a company that's that's uh, that signed you and is doing this stuff. I mean, it's really amazing to think about that anyone can do it on their own now. You never could have done this in the past. Um, I think it's incredible. This is like the best time. <laughs>